the global consortium uniting the world through education. Everybody, we could do a little better than that. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. That's a little bit better. I just saw Bernice give me the finger, which means we're ready to go back there. The little hand gesture, which says that we're ready. I am teaching a global studies class here and also teaching British history. And at the very, very last minute, I spoke to Dr. Namala, who's been on the show before, to talk about uh, India in the past and talk a little bit about the paradoxes of India. And so this is a, those encore performances where I try to get Dr. Namala to help me talk a little bit about the British legacy in India, talk a little bit about Gandhi, talk about the rising middle class, and talk a little bit about perspective. And so I'm very thrilled that Dr. Namala was willing to do that at the last minute. Another thing that you guys have heard me talk about is making a pitch for global education. And I really try not to coerce anybody. You come willingly or you don't come at all. It's kind of the attitude. But one of the points that I do ask is if you guys are interested in global education, if you're looking for people around the world like Dr. Namala, you're from where? India. Okay, he's from India. I didn't know that. But anyway, he's from India, and uh, we had people like Gilas Fursky last week from Israel, and you've known Chomsky and people like that around the world. I really need to start getting some feedback if that's of interest to you, and perhaps it isn't. Maybe you're not interested in having that kind of education of people around the world, but we really strive to do that. I think another thing that I always like to tell my students is that this is about an open forum. I try not to have a talking head for 80 minutes, including myself, to ask a couple of very good questions to show a couple of videos and so we can look at India. And for the benefit of my students that aren't in global studies, the beauty of the global studies class is the fact that I'm only covering 75 years uh, basically in the class, not like my 245 class where we go for 5,000 years in 18 weeks, which really allows us to go into these materials, the subject matter, very pithily, if you will, to ask the questions and bring it out. And in my 275 class, we were talking about the vivisection of India, as Gandhi called it, that Gandhi and Nehru and Jinnah were all on the same page when they were fighting the British, but we had the creation of Pakistan in 1947 and the conflicts that took place after. And so we're very interested about what takes place in that period from 1948 to the present, what's going on with India, and what are some of the paradoxes of India. And I just want to read a little blurb, it's too long for the memorization, but I wrote this a long time ago. India is a deliciously vibrant society with an increasingly vigorous internal dynamic and an increasing influence directly and indirectly in the global world. India's population of approximately 1.1 billion Indians constitutes 15% of the planetary population. The nation has the largest functioning democracy in the world today. India is a land of rising middle class, a country of plenty, and a country of poverty. She has one foot firmly placed in the future and one mired in the past. Bollywood and the untouchables are an integral part of the landscape. India is ancient, modern, powerful, and weak. India is indeed a land of paradox. And if we can give a round of applause one more time for Dr. Namala. It's good Thank to have you here. It's a real pleasure. I wanted to just start off for the benefit, and this is kind of your show, to really take your time to amplify. That you don't have to answer all the questions very quickly, but one of the things that I have been very interested in is talking about the British legacy in India, uh, some of the good things and some of the, the bad things. And as I said in my British history class, we just covered that. We were looking at a gentleman by the name of Cecil Rhodes who said that the British Empire was the best, that England was the best in the world, and the more the world was like England, the better the world would be. So I was wondering if you could just help out the students here and talk about what you see as, as any legacy of the British in India. Okay. Um, I think it's a, it's a mixed legacy. There are good things and, uh, and bad things about uh, uh, what has happened in the past. You know, any, any form of colonialism uh, in one sense is bad because colonialism by definition is you're imposing your will on the people, on others. Um, so in that sense, uh, nobody wants uh, uh, someone else, some foreign powers to come and tell them what to do, obviously. So um, 
but maybe I'll tell you in, in terms of my own uh, experience uh, why it is it is mixed. Um, you know, I'm I'm one of the few in India. I, I'm. I'm a Christian, I was born a Christian, and there are only like 2% of the population in India are, are Christian. Uh, but there's a background to, uh, to how, um, not I, we've been Christian, Christian for maybe three or four generations. But if you go back beyond that, actually my ancestors were uh, untouchables. Uh, you, you, I'm sure in history 245 about, we spoke uh, about who, that. Who are the untouchable? They are the lowest in the caste system, and uh, and one of the reasons that they became uh, Christian is because uh, uh, of the British influence. Um, uh, they 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 had no access to education or hospitals, and uh, after the British came, they had access to. They could go to mission hospitals and mission schools. Um, so in that respect, you know, it's a, it's a mixed, uh, mixed legacy. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if I were an untouchable in India, uh, if I hadn't become somewhere along the line, my family had become uh, Christian, uh, and that opened up um, other avenues. Um, so it's a mixed legacy uh, on, that, on a personal level. Uh, um, also, you know, modernization, uh, in one sense, uh, broke down the traditions of caste. Uh, you know, caste is if you were born into a um, family where you wash other people's clothes, and that's you keep doing that. Uh, if you're born into a family of traders, and that's all you should be doing. If you're born into a family of um, of priests, uh, then you know, they they are the upper caste. Um, so it's determined by birth. Um, so, I mean, modernization and English influence has broken all those traditions. Uh, uh, English is fairly predominant language in, uh, in India today. Uh, and, you know, you see all this outsourcing happening, and India wouldn't be what it is uh, without that influence of British influence of bringing the language, unifying the country uh, uh, through English. Uh, and all the educational institutions. I mean, India has uh, some of the top engineering schools uh, in the world. You, you may have heard of IIT. I don't know if you have heard. IITs, Indian Institute of Technology. It's much harder to get into those. There are five of them than into Harvard or Princeton. Uh, um, so, you know, education, infrastructure, um, India would not be what it is in, in some sense without that English influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, yeah. nobody wants to be colonized. Well, it's kind of funny <laughs> that you, you said that because we were addressing that in, in British history. And I asked my students if the, the British are bringing Christianity and there are elements of Hinduism that they don't like. And then if you think about the United States, Christian missionaries going to places like Hawaii and China. And I asked my students, what do you think about that if someone's spreading Christianity? Christianity and there's resistance and say, you know, in China we're Buddhist, we don't want Christianity, or we're Hindu or Muslim in, in India, and we don't want Christianity. But then on the other hand, what it seems to me that you're saying over the long haul that someone is converted to Christianity and they say, well, thank you very much. And we covered that just in class today saying, what is the selling point of Christianity? What if you're trying to pitch that and say, well, you know, everlasting life sounds pretty good if you're going to pitch Christianity. And then there's that, that element where people actually, you know, convert after they've been proselytized. And I have a, a friend of mine, I won't name her name to protect the innocent, but she is a, a nurse and she goes to Africa and spreads Christianity at the same time she gives shots for people and she's very humanitarian but I don't believe that the people get a shot unless they convert to Christianity so they go out there and say are you a believer and she said no well, you don't get the shot are you a believer no and then someone says yes I really need that shot and they become Christian so we, we talked a little bit about the proselytizing you yes. know, movement but yeah. what, what are the things is we've done this before and, and we kind of go back and share and just like they're having a cup of tea and, and just kind of taking it easy but I said that there's something to me me loathsome and lovable about the British and maybe married to somebody who's English I don't know but I I don't you know it's like I look at Cecil Rhodes and think you arrogant bastard you know the more the world is like England the better the world is gonna be but he believes it he's authentic he's, he's genuine 
And I think one of the things that we've talked about before is that you can get British historians and say, look what we did to India. We bought transportation. We have railroads there. We have sanitation. We have schools. You had just mentioned the, the English language, which is so important that you have all these dialects. It's very difficult for people to get a grasp on India. It's so exciting. It's so exotic, multicultural, multi-ethnic, but it's hard to have that communication and, and the English bring that around. And with respect to some of the great entrepreneurs in India, they would focus on the fact that English is really the language of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. which is obviously a, a vestige of leftover from the English. Mm -hmm. But I think another thing, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the British set up transportation and schools and the education and the, and the hospitals and the telegraph to serve their own interest in, in India. But I'm kind of wondering unwittingly if the British didn't help out India, because I think of that transformation, incredible transformation from 1948 to where India is mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And you think about it, you talk about bureaucracy, you talk about the law, mm -hmm. right? you talk about government policies, you talk about the English language, you talk about the greatest democracy in the world with more than 1.1 billion. And I'm not arguing that the British said, hmm, this is what we're trying to spawn or foster in India. But it seems to me that what happened in India, people said, you know, there, there's some infrastructure here. We have railroads. Yeah. We have sanitation, we have schools, we have the law. And I'm fond of, of saying this because my class tomorrow will see the film on Gandhi. One of the things at the, the very start that Gandhi, after he's hurt in South Africa, after he's wounded, he's got that bandage all over his head and it's very tight. And he, he sees his children and he comes out and they run Papa, Papa. And he says, look at these just wonderful English gentlemen. And his, and his wife scolds him. Remember, he says, you know, they are Indian boys, all right? And the reason I, I like that little part is that look at what these individuals are doing. They're copying the British. You know, Gandhi, the film starts when he's in South Africa and he gets kicked off the, off the train mm -hmm. because he, he bought mm -hmm. the, the train pass, you know, through the mail. So nobody's known that he's a, a very dark skinned individual. Mm -hmm. And then you see the trials and tribulations, you know, for, for Gandhi as he goes through. But the British, as they left that and you know, went out and, you know, went on their way, it seems to me that the Indians picked up on that. They said there's some good yes. seats here. Yeah. We, we do have bureaucracy. We do have a good system. But getting back to where's, where's Nehru studying? Where's Gandhi studying? Where's Jinnah studying? All these people are getting yes. that English education, and, and then they're kind of advancing the cause. So I kind of think unwittingly as the British were serving themselves. I mean, there isn't any doubt about yes. that. If they're looking yeah. at opium or, or they're going out there and getting the indigo or the cotton or sending their manufactured goods uh, to the Indians. Yes. And I think maybe one other thing needs to be addressed here also is this idea that India was a global trader when the East India Company arrived to India. I think that's what the fascination was. I think today there's a tendency to put the United States or Great Britain up on a pedestal and kind of look at India and as backward. The reason the British were interested in there is because they were a global marketplace. Sure. And, and sure. you know, the calicos that were coming in, the British, and I've said this in my British history class, wearing these old stuffy woolen jackets that smell like a wet, you know, they get wet and they smell like a dog. And all of a sudden you got these really light and flowing calicos that come from India. Very inexpensive, very colorful. If they get wet, they dry really quickly. And, uh, you know, it, it yeah. really is something, yeah. something happening yeah. very quickly. Yeah. Now, I want to ask a question and while you're answering the, the question for the group, I'm just going to load up a little YouTube. Uh, just it's it's a couple of years back, but I think it gives us kind of a, a picture yeah. of what's going on in India, the globalization, perhaps the disparity between the haves and the, and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. And then we have a little clip of your, your brothers, okay. uh, and I thought maybe you can kind of uh, address that. But I think that if you could just stop for a second. I, I really thought about this in my last class while I was actually teaching another class. I was teaching Andrew Jackson, but I was thinking about Gandhi while I was doing that. It's become really easy to do that. I <laughs> teach Andrew Jackson, you know, prepare them for their exam, but, but do that. I really wonder what Gandhi, if Gandhi were alive today, what he would say of India after all these years. And I think that there's a tendency for us in, in the West, and particularly in the United States, to focus on parts of Gandhi where we really don't know Gandhi. What I mean is I think we like to think about the peace and the nonviolent resistance. I mean, things we should know, but other aspects, socialistic aspects of Gandhi, what he thought about industrialization, mm -hmm. what he thought about the people in, in the lower caste, you know, I mean, even some of his sexual, uh, some of the sexual mores <laughs> of, of Gandhi, some mm -hmm. of the things that he did, probably mm -hmm. people would know, but 
I, I think it would be stunning after 60 years, 60 years to say, my God, look where, where India is today. How did that happen? How did India go from 1948? We saw that in the in the global class with all the violence taking place between Hindus and Muslims. And I told the class, you imagine taking millions of people in India and saying, if you want to go to Pakistan, you go this way. If you want to stay in India, you go this way. The Muslims are over here. The Hindus are over here. And and seeing all that that violence, you know, that takes mm -hmm. place. And then look how you know India. The, their achievements in, in 60 years. I was wondering if you could tell me wh what's going on in India? Wh where are the achievements? Where, what's the background for those achievements? Look, before yeah. um, I go on to that, just a couple of things regarding what we were talking earlier on. I think maybe two things about British uh, uh, influence in India. One is, I don't think we can make a simplistic argument that, okay, everything was bad, you know, they came just to plunder and you take. Um, there were also people who were genuinely interested in, uh, you know, uh, helping uh, others, uh, seeing the poverty there and helping or some of the missionaries. Maybe their intention was, was to proselytize, but there were also some, I'm thinking of Andrews, um, he was Gandhi's friend. Oh, what's he's in the film too? Uh, this Brit. Uh, oh, the English missionary. missionary. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So there are many. So I don't think we can make a simplistic. Uh, have a broad, uh, you know, paint with a broad brush that it was all bad. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more. Uh, it's more ambiguous and more complicated than that. And second is, you know, it depends on. Who, who you ask, if it's an untouchable in India, uh, uh, who always you know, lived separately, uh, couldn't mingle with the others, whether it was the Indian boss or the British boss, he really doesn't give a uh, hoot <laughs> who that you can is. say damn on my show, I don't care. Yeah, okay. I don't know if we are on TV. I swear all the time in my class. Yeah. I know. So do I. So that's why we're brothers. <laughs> but, um, you know, for, the, for, for an untouchable, it didn't matter. Actually, maybe the British was, was even better because they believed in some semblance of equality, whereas the Indian would not even touch. You'd have to sit separately, eat separately, eat probably you'll see the film. So it also depends on who you ask. Mm, I mean, what the Brit British legacy is, where you are in the Indian system. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, those two things. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So. And what would Gandhi think about well, India I, I today? Think, or what, where well, is it? It's kind of a double <laughs> question I'm asking you. I just think that the India is a meteoric rise in many respects. We'll talk about the paradoxes here. And the reason I say that we think of Bollywood, I was talking about a lot of Indian music. I hear that, you know, like in the car and I start dancing, it just gets me going when I, when I hear that. And uh, but it does, because, you know, I'm in traffic on the 605 for an hour, so I just get out there and, you know, dance with the people next to me. But as you go down the, the freeway, you know, doing those kinds of things, but we, we see the rising middle class, uh, we see the technology. I think in this film, the, the Indians say when you deal with Americans, you have to think of them as babies. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of an interesting kind of, you see a bit of competition taking place. We talk about outsourcing, and if your computer breaks down, you call somebody, and it's likely that somebody from India will speak to you. I think we'll see that, but I think there's a placard up there that says, whatever it is, if you're talking to somebody from the United States, imagine that they're like children, you have to really really break it down for them when you explain what's wrong with a computer and there's a certain edge of competitiveness that, that you see but remarkable achievements in 60 years but I think the point also I think Gandhi would probably be astounded to see what what took place but also I kind of wonder about what Gandhi's vision was for India because it seems in, in many ways it went in a very different direction than, than Gandhi had argued or, or had advocated for so I guess I'm asking you two things what, what do you think Gandhi would say looking back and what do you think are the keys for, for the success uh, that we see in India today. And while you do that, I'll, I'll okay. click on that little. Okay. <laughs> well, I think um, Gandhi's vision of India was quite different from, uh, uh, from Nehru. Uh, Nehru was our first uh, prime minister. And he was more modern, and I guess you could some with quotations, you can say forward looking, who wanted India to be industrialized like Britain and others. Um, Gandhi was not so enamored by that. Gandhi believed in, you know, uh, um, self rule, village panchayats, uh, uh, being self sufficient. And uh, um, so, in, in 
I mean, at least my understanding of Gandhi is more about not about not just about material development, but also your inner self or spiritual development. So in that sense, I think Gandhi would be disappointed. Uh, I mean, India has uh, veered off in a different direction, quite different from what um, Gandhi uh, anticipated. Um, well, and we can talk uh, okay. talk more about the paradoxes. Sure, and, sure. Hmm. Okay. I hope that I've done this. I don't have this on my screen, so I had to look at the big screen to see if I had, and I realized Oops. it was just muted. So I'm going to show this, this little part, <laughs> and then just wondering, did you break the only good chair we have? Uh, okay. Almost did. Uh, I'm just if wondering, because, you know, we have one good chair, and that's it. But anyway, let's see if I can do this, get, get this, this thing started. and. Here. Dawn in India, a nation of one billion awakes. In Bombay, there is a human density unlike anywhere else. Compared to Manhattan, there are twice as many people in half the space. This is a working class home. Dad is a laborer, mom is a maid, the kids go to school. So how long have you lived here? More than two years. In Delhi, the vegetable market comes to life, teeming, churning, a hive of pent-up entrepreneurial energy where personal space is the rarest commodity of all. Meanwhile, in the suburbs, dawn marks the end of the day at the call centers. Hundreds of thousands of Indians spent the night on American time, answering angry computer questions from Florida, reminding Texans to pay their credit card bill. Ma'am, the amount here is $128. While we sleep, they do our taxes, file our insurance claims, and read our x-rays. But for the talented and ambitious, these jobs just one rung in the ladder. With its manicured lawns and architectural wonders, Infosys is the Microsoft of Bangalore. They have long stopped advertising, help wanted. In the last 12 months, we received 1.4 million applications from young people around the country for jobs. Less than 2% are offered a position. Hey, what's, Abhi, up, what's up? And as a sign of the times, this Indian company is now hiring American graduates. So if this is what's possible, why does most of India still look like this? Well, for starters, it is the world's largest and most diverse democracy. Though some will protest his foreign policy, President Bush is visiting the most pro-American country outside the U.S., a freedom-loving mix of almost every known religion, home to 150 million peaceful Muslims. Imagine if that one-fifth of humanity in India were living like the people of Iraq today, blowing each other up in their houses of worship every other day and on the street. How the different our world would be. So to me, India is a miracle. But there is nothing tidy about this country, and that includes Indian democracy. It is a big, sloppy thicket of red tape, party politics, and corruption. Very little gets built or fixed. Mass transit is miserable. Water and power are a horror. In the capital of Delhi, a third of the electricity is stolen. People just splice in and help themselves. And the traffic? Oh, the traffic. But if you sit here long enough and just watch, there's a method that emerges from the madness, transactions, rituals, patterns. It's the same sort of self-organizing system scientists observe in ant hills and beehives. Somehow, against all odds, things get done. And this might just be the secret to future success. C.K. Prahalad is an Indian-born American and a renowned business consultant. He says we should look at this grit and chaos, not with pity, but with respect and fear because this is the training ground for the next wave of global titans. Every kid here who is walking around is getting trained to be entrepreneur, to hustle, and to get a little bit more than what he or she has. If you look at this, you're unlikely to see that this is a place where people are going to get educated on how to use computers. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't look like much. In other words, I think this is a metaphor for India. What you see outside is not what is inside. Outside, this could be a shanty, but inside is a Pentium PC. 
I met Fareed while stepping over rats in a Bombay neighborhood. He was sending text messages on his cell phone. What is your ID, email ID? Uh, my, you want my email address? Uh, want... There are 700 million Indians under the age of 35, two and a half times the U.S. population. And there was a day when the best and brightest would eagerly bring their brain power to America. But post 9-11, visas are tougher to get. And with a mall and a McDonald's right down the street, why leave home? 3.01 Priyanka is a popular DJ in Delhi. Hi, welcome to Radio City. And she conducted an on-air poll at our request. If you had a choice between taking your skills to America or staying in India, what would you do? The text message responses were almost unanimous. Look at that. We will challenge Westerners by working for our country because India is best. And that level of fierce pride and determination is evident everywhere. Is India catching up? India is not behind you. He's with you. Not behind us, with us. You're seeing an explosion of 50 years of pent-up aspirations. And if you want to know what India feels like today, it's very simple. Pull out a champagne bottle, shake it for an hour, then take the cork off. You don't want to get in the way of that cork. Delhi, through the choking, honking masses of auto rickshaws and sacred cows, past the shiny malls and shantytown slums, and in the middle of a dusty, booming office park, I found America's switchboard, back office to the world. Would you like to make a check over the phone? I can post any check also. For a starting salary of around two bucks an hour, upwardly mobile Indians spend their nights answering questions from confused appliance owners in Kansas and Wisconsin. What the Americans don't hear is the curses back. There's a common practice to put the phone on mute and curse people right back. One Night at the Call Center is a runaway bestseller in India. In it, novelist Chetan Bhagat exposes the frustrations of this job, and his research revealed an interesting training method. At one call center, they teach new hires that 35 equals 10. They say that a 35-year-old American's IQ is same as a 10-year-old Indian's IQ. So imagine you're talking to a child, and so don't lose your cool when you're talking to them. But this is exactly what was being taught. Such revelations do little to ease outsourcing resentment, but this just might. A new study finds that India is not siphoning millions of American jobs after all. In fact, the U.S. tech sector has grown by 17% since the practice took off. The numbers of jobs going to India for purely outsourcing reasons is quite small. And that the U.S. firms that are doing it are getting stronger, more competitive, more able to hire more people. And experts believe that by dialing India, you're not only making American companies stronger, you're making the world safer. A few years ago, India and Pakistan were on the brink of nuclear war. The Indian business community, particularly the high-tech community, um, came to the leaders in New Delhi and said, uh, uh, excuse us, um, uh, like, could you please not use the N-word anymore, nuclear, okay? Because um, we're like running the back rooms of the world's biggest companies from American Express to General Electric, and we can't take a week off for war. And the government in New Delhi uh, got the message. That ceasefire not brought to you by General Powell. That ceasefire brought to you by General Electric. It's not just corporate America tapping into India's cheap brain power, it's middle America. When Texas mom Elizabeth Mitchell saw her son Jason struggling with math, she hired a tutor in India. I've wondered what kind of house she lives in. I wondered what her parents are like, and but she seems really nice. Well, Jason, we found her. 24-year-old Swati Chopra lives with her parents in this Delhi neighborhood. Here's the computer she uses to teach you in Plano. And you're right, she is nice. When it comes to teaching American kids, she says she has to be. In India, you can school kids, but there you have to be very patient with them. You have to be very sweet with them. If you are not able to do this, let's try something else. Let's play a game, and maybe after that, you'll feel like doing it. You know, he's actually eager to sit down and get his homework done so that he can go off and play and do other things. While math is now Jason's best subject, Swati has drawn a sobering conclusion from the rest of her students. If you teach a student in India who's in the seventh grade, and you teach a student in 
US who is in 10th or 9th grade, their level will be same. So there's a gap of at least three grades between the students. If tutors like Swati can help close that gap, outsourcing our kids' educations may not be so radical. After all, some Americans are outsourcing themselves to India for surgery. I got to the point to where I couldn't do things, functions with the family, the pain was too severe. Insurance wouldn't cover Dennis Berry, and he couldn't afford an operation in his home state of Florida. So he flew to Delhi, where a world-class surgeon replaced both of his hips for $20,000, a savings of $100,000. That includes my airlines, my friends' airlines. It includes the whole package. <laughs> it's very impressive. We've got to remember, we've been outsourcing goods or services for 70 years in America. And all that time, average American incomes have risen to now be the highest in the world. So if outsourcing has been a bad idea, we, for 70 years we've been doing it and doing pretty well. All right, we just hit the lights there. What I was going to say, thank you very much. I was going to say, Dr. Namala, maybe if you bring your chair over, remember that's the only good one, <laughs> that if you bring the, that chair over, I just would, you know, obviously that's a little eight minute clip or nine minute clip, something like that. What you thought about that, and I think this might be a good place too for, for the students to jump. I found my competitiveness picking up after I watched that video. I started to feel like a slacker and like, uh, I don't know, if you explain something to me, remember I'm a 10 year old. Anyway, we, we, we go up there and have a little, little conversation because I think it really opened up something here. But, I mean, any observations? I mean, was that a fairly accurate picture, do you think? We saw a lot of congestion. We saw a lot of <laughs> smart people. We, you know, any feedback from you on that? Well, uh, I, I think I agree with that. But to some extent, I think India is a little, uh, at least in the West, um, uh, it's a little overblown. Uh, you know, if you look at India, um, yes, it is uh, 1.2 billion people, its GDP is 1.3 trillion, and um, they say by the year 2032 or so that India would be the third largest economy in the world, uh, US, um, China, and then India. India would beat Japan. Uh, maybe, but I think uh, India has a long ways to go. I think it's some of it is, is uh, at least in the West, uh, there's a lot of hype about India. Um, for the simple fact that, uh, uh, you know, about 800, uh, recently, about three, four years ago, the Indian government did a, a survey of the unorganized sector in, 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 in India. 800 million people in India earn less than $2 a day. Uh, if you look at uh, the Forbes, Forbes magazine, you know, the top um, 10, the richest billionaires, uh, uh, I think uh, India has the most number of billionaires in, coming from Asia, beating, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, even Japan and China. Uh, if you look at the top 10 billionaires in the world, uh, four are from India. And there's one guy called Lakshmi Mittal. He owns most of the steel companies uh, in the world. And recently, for he lives in England, and for his daughter's man marriage, they spent $80 million um, just on the wedding. Uh, and so there's that kind of wealth. Uh, there are these Ambani brothers, uh, they're billionaires. Uh, they're in petroleum and uh, clothing and all. It's like a conglomerate. Uh, real estate, there's one guy called Kripal Singh. So, you know, there are the top four are Indians out of ten. On the other extreme, there are 800 million people who earn less than $2 a day. Um, the way they define middle class is uh, anybody who can spend anywhere from 2 to $20 a day. Um, so, according to that count, Indian middle class is about, um, I, I've read statistics, maybe 26 million. Uh, so, if you look at the distribution of income in India, it's like a pyramid, very few at the top. And there's hardly not, there's some middle class, but lots at the poor. China is actually, interesting enough, it's quite different. It's like a diamond. 
China's distribution of income. They don't have many poor people. They have a big middle class, uh, quite a vast, who can spend according to this definition of 2 to $20. And then a few really rich. So China's distribution of income is, is healthier than, than the Indian. So, so I just think India has a long ways to go. I mean, it's one third the size of the US has four times the population of US, and there simply are not enough resources to every, for every Indian to have um, you know, the kind of standard of living that we have, simply mm -hmm. structurally impossible. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hype about I think even China may, may be impossible, but China is much larger and more resource intensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, that's just a sobering thought. In, yes, there are people who, who are doing well, who don't know what to do with their money, but there are many who struggle. I mean, my sister is a high school teacher uh, for a long time, 20 years, and it's like, you know, maybe 20,000 rupees. How much is that? $500 uh, a, a month, uh, roughly. Um, and it's hard for her to make a living. Uh, teachers you know, everywhere, huh? That's right. <laughs> yes, yes. Doesn't matter where yes, you are, yeah, they don't want yeah. to pay teachers. Yeah, uh, that's true. Maybe I should convert mine into rupees, it will sound better. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we can go for our yeah. health care in India. Oh, 10,000 rupees I got on this paycheck. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, you know, and she, she struggles uh, making ends meet. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're lucky, some of them work for uh, these um, outsourcing firms. And, you know, those are miserable lives. You're, during the day, you're all groggy because uh, that's the time you're supposed to be sleeping. They go to work around 5 in the evening. Uh, and then they're talking to all these angry customers and they have to change their whole accent and talk not weird like me, but American accent. Uh, and then be nice, like as if they're talking to a five-year-old or 10-year-old. Uh, and they, they are, they, they're all young. You know, all these guys who do that, uh, they're from their 18 to 19 to about um, 25 or 30. And after that, you're done. You can't be doing all your life. And you know, and it's uh, it's like you know they say hi, I'm Bob and I'm uh, Richard and their name is actually Krishna Mohan or, or something else. But they say hi, I'm Bob, I'm Sparky. Call me Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I mean, it, 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 in some ways, it's a disconnected life. You know, here I here they are making like. Mm, uh, I don't know, five dollars an hour or three dollars an hour, and then talking to another guy, financing his Mercedes Benz for seventy-five thousand, and financing that guy's house for five hundred thousand. Then it's, it's the disconnected lives. Um, I don't know how long they can keep doing that. I'm sure you don't see many older people. I mean, it has started only like last. 15 years, so we'll see what are the long-term effects of yeah. that kind of job. But there you don't really make that much. <laughs> I remember on NPR, and I shared this with the class, that there was a scavenger who thought he was on top of the pile, no pun intended, but making $3 a day. And he said most scavengers make a dollar a day, but he was making three dollars and he was protesting against the government of India to get protection for scavengers. They wanted governmental protection. And I was really taken aback and I felt very, you know, humble when someone felt they were doing very well for themselves at, at three dollars. Yes. Because most of my yes. my colleagues here are making a dollar yes. and I'm making three dollars. Yes. One thing that I picked up on the video, and I don't know how other people saw it, I saw that gentleman on the computer who was tapping away. And I think that a lot of us to our sensibility that would appear repugnant, you know, a shanty little town. But what I saw in there was an entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't yes, see someone that yes. was defeated by, by the surroundings. It was like, what was going on internally? You see it as a shanty. I've got a damn, you know, computer. Now, see, you got me going, doing that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and getting that computer and say, you know what? You see shanty, I see entrepreneur. Yes. You see this, yes. this is what I see. It's, yes. it's these different views out there. And I don't know about you, when I talk about that kind of competitive feeling, I remember that uh, Peter Maloney had a guest speaker and I remember that he was very, I don't know, were you yes, there? Yeah. You were there and you could help me out because I don't remember exactly. 
but I think if I remember what the presentation was about, that he said to all you young Americans that are used to, you know, becoming teenagers and becoming 19 or 20 and demanding $10 or $12 an hour because you're an American and the world owes you that, you see somebody here doing that. And I think that the wage that they were talking about it wasn't a big wage, but I think what was interesting, incredibly educated that goes along with that wage. A lot of people having yes. wonderful educations and incredibly bright and incredibly smart. So you understand uh, why someone will be interested in that. It's not like you're just paying a wacky because you're paying them low amounts of money. The education, the smarts, the tenacity, the work ethic is there to get the results that you want, but, but the money saves people a, yes. lot, of, a lot of money. Yeah. Now, on, on the flip side of that, and I've asked people, when you, let, me, let me ask you just here, if you guys have a problem with your computer or anything that you've spoken to people around the world on, and, and I ask you to characterize the people on the other end, what would you say, what are some of the characterizations? Huh? I heard somebody say, what, what would you say you call? Okay, meaning what? Ac accents? Okay. One thing that I was thinking of was about friendliness. You ever notice these people don't ever get ticked off about anything? You're ticked off, but they're just like, oh my God, just relax. You know, we're, we're going to solve that problem. We care about you and we care about the service. And you're like, you know, and I heard a guy at NPR, he just cracked me up on there. And he says, you know what? Their kindness is killing me. Just fix the damn problem. I don't care about having a beautiful day here. My computer won't freaking work. And, you know, but I, I've heard people over and my wife is British and her steam's coming out of her ears. And they, they're saying, you know, namaste, relax. What is your, your problem. My wife is saying, just fix the problem. Just fix the problem. And I noticed that around, I think this is a tendency of Americans. We had a problem, fix it. Yes, uh, you know, yeah. we, we want that to take place. And we don't like when people are kind to us. We don't want that. We want, we want, we're pragmatic. We want some changes, yes. you know, taking yeah. place. So, yeah. all right. I thought, you know, just I'm watching Tom and I want to give students an opportunity to ask you questions. And I have one more little clip that I have to do about your brother's okay. video. Hmm. But I thought perhaps you, you talked a little bit about Christianity and maybe you talked a little bit about Paul and what kind of work you've been doing and one of the things that, that I try and that's all I can say is is a teacher I showed this little clip in history 245 class which I mentioned to you and I think to American sensibilities they were repugnant by the fact that a, a lot of these individuals a nine-year-old young lady mm -hmm. here who was sent to the back of the classroom and then at some point was dismissed and was not allowed to come back and she cries in the video and she says all I wanted to do is to to be a, a, a doctor Mm -hmm. and, and I don't have that opportunity. And, you know, she sat in the front of the classroom so she could take, I always love students to sit in the front that really are interested in that education and, and couldn't get it. But I also said, in teaching this class, the world civ, that I felt that I had to kind of ground it in the religions of India so people understand what that tension is, that there's another part to the story why people aren't touching untouchables. And uh, you remember that, that film, that the story of India, that where that British guy comes in and does the whole series on there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I think he does a very good job. Yes. But one of the parts that I like where there is a, uh, the guy at the lowest class there, an untouchable, where he's burning all the bodies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he has a real sense of humor. And he says, I don't care who you are. You can be the prime minister of India. You could be a Brahmin. You could be at the very top. In Everybody the end, comes <laughs> through me. All right? Everybody, if you die and you're going to be in the funeral pyre, I'm the guy who does that. And so you, you saw a little bit of that, that mingling. But what, would you give him just a little bit of background about your work, your brother's work, what it's about, what the, uh, the tension is with Untouch, what's kind of ground okay. it. Okay. And then I'll set this up and get you ready okay. for the video. Okay. Um, before I, I came, uh, actually I came to the U.S. Uh, in 1980 and then I, I got my undergraduate degree and I went back to India and then when I went back, uh, I worked with my brother. I was actually very idealistic. I'd seen uh, the movie Gandhi and I, I wanted to go back and help my people and my country. And uh, so along with my brother, we worked with um, untouchables, um, especially in, in the rural areas. You know, sometimes it's hidden in, in, in the cities. You don't see that as much. But in the rural areas, you'd see uh, literally untouchables. You'd see if, if this is the, the village. Uh, they are not. Um, they cannot live in the main village. They live in a separate village. Uh, they cannot mingle. And uh, when they walk, uh, and they, their access to the outside world is usually through the main village. 
And uh, there are codes like you cannot, if you're an untouchable, you cannot wear white dress. Only the upper caste uh, can wear. And when you walk through the main village, then you have to remove your shoes and hold them in your hand and walk through. Um, they have a separate, um, you know, um, water. They drink from a dif different pond, and the main um, upper caste um, cannot go there, or they cannot come to this village to drink the water. So it's basically like segregation. What it was like, um, uh, maybe um, in the 50s or even earlier here in the south. Uh, restaurants, you sit uh, outside, separate uh, places, uh, separate seats, separate plates. Um, I, I mean, I was shocked. I, I didn't uh, know all of this growing up, but when I went, and you could see uh, in the villages, uh, there will be an untouchable who would go to a store and literally um, he wouldn't, he cannot hand the money over to the shopkeeper. Instead, he would throw the money. And the shopkeeper would pick it up, and then he'd say, what do you want? OK, that cigarette. And the shopkeeper would th take the cigarette and throw it to him, and the guy will catch it. So anyway, my brother is involved in this work, uh, basically. You know, in, by law, untouchability is illegal. It's unconstitutional ever since the Indian constitution came about. Um, but, you know, this, it still exists uh, to some extent. Um, mm, uh, some of it is gone, but it still exists. And my brother's work is basically bringing awareness to this issue, and, uh, and uh, there are lots of atrocities done against them, and uh, um, he has legal help, and also bringing awareness through putting pressure on the, in the Indian government through going to other European Union and stuff like that. Yeah. So I said it's quite an achievement that your brother's getting the audiences that he is now. That's right. He's been working yes. at this in The Hague, and he just, uh, you know, it's to get somebody else into, you know, to listen to what's going on yes. in India is an yeah. incredible a achievement. So, shall I play? Sure. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Oops. Maybe I shouldn't.
પેટ માટે તો આપડે ગમે તે યોજના કરવી પડે છીપે બચે પકડા ગયો મરા ગયા 
जो कान करने के दरमियान तो केवल गाना ही गाते थे ऐसा गाना गाते थे जो जिस उत्तेजना फैले जो कान करने वाले में जी नर संघारवा कर बे भाई जी की अब की बारी इमामगंज के पारी हजारवा कट बे भाई जी से बात थे कटनी माले साले बाथानी कटल संग्रामिया से मिया बीघा जाके देख कटनी गो जब हमारी सामाजिक और पारिवारिक लोगों पर कह ढाया गया एमसीसी द्वारा पीपुल्स पार्टी के ग्रुप द्वारा या माले समर्थकों द्वारा तब यह मजबूरी में हमें हथियार उठाना पड़ा जिससे हमारी इज्जत और प्रशिष्टा जान की सुरक्षा हो रात के टाइम में रामस्त्र के साथ में और इन लोगों ने शरण लिया झपड़ा झपड़ी में और एक बाई एक इस गुंडा भी उन्होंने ये जो गांव वाले मिल करके और सुरेश गुंडा भी रोहन मिल करके हसब आ करके आना धोन गोली चलाने लगे घेर करके और आग लगा करके सभी आदमी को जला दिया है और गोली से भून दिया करीब करीब छः सौ रन चार घंटा गोली चलाए आए आठ बजे से कुछ नहीं बोलता है कुछ नहीं सब आई पी ओ को जवा हमी तो कुछ नहीं बोलता है नहीं खाया वर्ष गया पी पाचड़ बेसा मीडिया केम के छोक अभड़ा मीडिया छोक के साहब हमने पाचड़ बेसा पहले थी करता अमे कई मन में लेता न अमे कीधु हम आप दरोज नई गो आई रीते कर सी तो भरसू के पे छता में जय समझूती पड़ी तार कीधु एट उतरी गया पी घु के नर्स बनसू ने डॉक्टर बनसू एवं बढ़ू शू बधु भांगी गयु ए पी हम भरवा कई रू नहीं पी शू बनवा खोलो ना ने She can come in my class. Messi. Okay, Dr. Namala, would it be okay if we open it up a little bit so people could ask you some some questions? This usually stimulates the conversation. Now, for you people that have been with me before in these, I always say to you, take advantage of something that we have here. Dr. Namala is a very busy man, and he has come out here to uh, help us and and take on any of the questions. If you wish to speak in the microphone, please don't shift it like a gear. You just push the button there, and if the green light comes on, you're you're ready to go. Would anybody like to make any comments, ask any questions of Dr. Namala here today? Can you get close to a microphone? Yeah. And if you could just introduce yourself, I know who you are, but for the benefit of everybody else and Dr. Namala. And My name is Inas. Is, is your green light on? It is. Okay. Should I get closer? Maybe a little. For me. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Inas, and I'm in the Global Studies class. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. The first video that we watched is um, kind of like pro the democracy there, and it kind of just glanced over the poverty part of India, and it it was more of like, oh look, everyone's doing fine, you know. But um, then you mentioned how like so many people are making less than two dollars a day, and we also heard that statistic for Egypt. 
how so many of them were making less than $2 a day or just $2 a day. Um, and then they had a revolution and they didn't want that anymore. Do you see the people of India ever rising up anytime soon and kind of wanting to change that? You know, that's a good question. Um, Indian democracy is more complicated than that. I think India is, uh, in terms of, uh, it, it is more democratic in some ways than, um, uh, than Egypt and also probably, I would say, in terms of just voter participation, it's higher than the U.S. I think U.S. Uh, 2008, 58 percent participated. India is about 62 percent. Um, um, so in that sense, you know, it, it is at least in terms of parliamentary democracy, everybody goes and votes. But Indian uh, situation is more complex, I think, because of caste. You know, if you're born a Hindu um, and you're in one of those uh, uh, caste systems and not even if you're an untouchable, you have internalized centuries of uh, thinking that, you know, I am impure uh, or if, I, if you are an untouchable baby, they think I'm really impure. If my shadow falls on that person, then uh, that person is polluted. So. Uh, it, th it took centuries for that to form, and to change that, it's, uh, it takes some time, I think. So it's, um, at, at some level, at, some, at a deeper level, people have to think, okay, I'm just as good as some, that other person. Um, I'll tell Paula, you. Would you like my, oh, so I, I think, should be sitting? Well, oh, okay. I think you should be higher oh, than okay, me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So I want you and the, the guest out here, so I think you should. Well, I'll give you one example. You know, when I was, back when I was in the villages, and I, I stayed in that um, village where the untouchables live, and we started, we wanted uh, literacy. Um, we start, we wanted to start a literacy, um, uh, a small school. And we just, uh, we asked um, some of the people there, young guys, to help us build a school. And it was a small hut that we built. And then there was one old man, he was maybe in his 60s from the main village, who came and he did not like what was being done here, why, why we were building a school. And this single old, older person, upper caste man, came and wiped out the whole school, you know, the, the poles that we had built. And there were these young guys who were all untouchables, you know, in their 20s and uh, uh, really well built. But they were so scared of this guy. I mean, they could have easily taken him out. But uh, internally, they, they thought this is, uh, mm. they cannot do that. They were just so worried. That, yeah. And this was 20 years ago. I, I'm, I'm sure things have changed. But yeah, I wanted to say, you, mm. you had mentioned something about the civil rights movement. I don't know if the students here have seen, but there's a, a little film where they take a, a young African-American girl, I'm guessing maybe about eight years of age, and they come with her and they have an African-American doll and they have a white doll and they come to the african-american and little girl and say you pick which one you know you want you can have the african-american one or you can have the the caucasian doll and i think there's an assumption there that she's going to take the african-american mm -hmm. doll and she ends up taking the white doll or the caucasian doll and they ask her why and she said because the, the white one is clean the, the black one is dirty mm -hmm. and and I, I see some parallels here yes. you're talking about when something when abuse has been heaped upon you through the centuries it's very difficult to transcend yes. that and you see that yes. you know some of those those yeah. parallels there yeah. okay did yeah. you you know did you have another question or did <laughs> no no that's okay she, she won't mind <laughs> I'm sure Sorry, I she took a like long-winded nice answer. No, 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 you. You, it was a good answer. Um, thanks for the answer, by the way. I just also wanted to ask how you had mentioned how um, China's society is like healthier, you described it, and how it's more like a diamond shape, mm -hmm. as opposed to like the triangle. Um, I wanted to ask, do you think that's because um, like India is described as a democracy, whereas China is more of like a, like a they have, a, I think, a unitary government, or they're more like, Communists, so or they, totalitarian. Yeah, yes. so they yeah. don't really, they're not as materialistic, so do you think that's what makes them, I guess, better in that sense, better off? Um, well, I mean, I don't want to glorify China. China is, is a totalitarian system. But in terms of distribution of income, 
uh, in that sense, I think China is healthier. I, I don't mean to say that it's healthier, you know, politically, uh, but uh, maybe because of, you know, Mao, Maoist influence in, in China um, has sort of uh, made a difference, uh, I think. Um, but politically, I, I think uh, maybe in India is certainly more democratic uh, than, than China. Hmm. All right, other questions? Okay, we have, we have one, please. All right. um, I was just wondering, why do you think there's such a large discrepancy between the Indian or Southeast Asian education system and, as opposed to like American? Like even up to three or four years, you know, like the level of education. Um, you know, again, you cannot generalize in India, um, not all schools are like that, 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 that high level of education. Is that what you're referring to? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's my bad. I didn't like, specific, like, I wasn't specific enough in my question, but like, like what most people see, like what the world sees. You yes. know? Obviously, like for example, the BBC, I mean the ABC video that we watched earlier, it showed like, you know, the people who are working in the bigger, larger corporations and things like that where their level of, it, of education seems to be three or four years higher than what people yeah. are achieving here, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, um, mainly because I think there is a lot more competition in India. You know, there are fewer schools and there are, you know, there may be mission schools or private schools and there are so many people who want to get there. So for, right from the beginning, at least in middle class families, you have, uh, you know, parents uh, uh, hiring a tutor for you, making sure that uh, you learn everything. And, you know, uh, my, my nieces, uh, um, ninth grade, they, they're doing calculus and uh, all, all this uh, trick and all that. Um, uh, so right at the, they, they ramp up the curriculum right at the, at, at very early age, and they get tutoring from this. But this is middle class, and middle class, you know, there are few. Uh, recently, Wall Street Journal had an article uh, which said that about the education system in India, and said um, some I don't know exactly something like if you finished high school for most Indians. Uh, um, that's like fifth grade level. So, you know, for last, large part of public schools, it's not that good. But private schools and for these middle class, yes, the standard is much higher and much more competitive. Mm. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Joe. And uh, I was wondering, when we were talking about the uh, competition between the education in America and India, and like uh, he previously just said, that, that there's that age gap. But what I was wondering about also is the uh, pyramid, like you were saying, there's so much um, poverty in India, and at the same time, there's still those, those uh, like you said, kind of civil rights and human rights uh, issues that are still going on. And that I was wondering how directly that uh, relates to each other. If you have people who are educated and seem more educated than, you could say, Americans, then I feel like shouldn't you be uh, further along in abolishing things like such we did, we abolish slavery, shouldn't you be further along in abolishing, say, the cultural differences between the non-touchables and the elites who seem to be in the upper class in mm -hmm. education? So like, uh, what kind of redistribution of education can go along with the redistribution of wealth kind of thing? I'm kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think then we have to ask um, what is the mission of education? Ideally, education is, uh, if education is about knowing about others, expanding your world, expanding your knowledge, and helping others, then that should happen. Um, but if education is about yeah, knowing about myself, how to get, a, get ahead in the game, then that might not necessarily lead to helping others. Um, so, I mean, ideally, in the ideal world, education should be about helping us and also helping the community. 
but often times we see that uh, even here uh, the more educated I get maybe the more selfish I get I'm, I'm looking at myself and I want to get better I want to be one of the top 10 billionaires in the world and maybe I don't necessarily give a damn about <laughs> the others um, so is it guaranteed that uh, an educated individual would be an enlightened individual? Uh, we hope so, but it doesn't always pan out that way. <laughs> okay, other questions out there? If you can yeah, come, just, one. yeah, please. Why don't you get yourself close to a microphone while we I was just wondering, my name's Robert. Uh, how big do, is uh, religion, how big is religion's role in everyday or in the society of India? Very big. Um, well, yeah, it is very big, much more significant than what it is here. I think in, in, uh, religion defines you, um, you know, even in your caste, uh, whether you're one, in one of those four castes, and it's more complex than that. Within a caste, there are many different um, subsections or gotras, they call. And, you know, even uh, intermarriage, even within a caste, there are rules which group you can marry. Um, um, and, um, you know, that stays on even here. You, when you, if you come to the U.S. here, and you can go to any website, uh, you, you say Indian seeking someone else, they have uh, websites where you can, uh, uh, you know, the arranged marriages, and, um, and you'll see websites here, oh, a Brahmin boy who's, who's uh, you know, one of the top cars there. will always be Brahmin boy. He may be like 40 years old, but they'll say, Brahmin boy looking for a fair-looking Brahmin girl. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's religion uh, matters a lot. Uh, I mean, who you socialize with, uh, religion matters. Some of it may be changing in, in the cities uh, with, with the youth. But uh, when it comes to important things like marriages, um, religion is very important. And very rarely you'll see mm, people marrying out of their caste uh, and out of their religion is even rare. Mm. Okay, we got a question right yeah. up in front. Mm. Um, I have a question for personal floor. And um, I heard when um, Dr. Howe's opening, he said that he was scared I mean, um, I was born into a Christian family uh, because three generations or four generations ago, my grand grandparents, uh, great great grandparents, they converted to Christianity. So, uh, and actually, my father was uh, in the church. Um, um, so I was born into a Christian family, and when I go and um, uh, or when I did uh, work with the untouchables, and my brother still does, um, I don't think it's based on uh, religion. Um, he he sees that as a human rights issue, uh, and I see it as also as a human rights issue, and regardless of what uh, what religion you are, um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Going back to the marriages, um, what would happen if a Dali Dalit, ma uh -huh. Dalit marries Abraham? Um, you know, um, that's where some of the one of the worst atrocities happen. Um, if it does happen, sometimes you know both the families may be enlightened and it's okay, but it's very rare. Usually, the Brahmin family will uh, disown that person. Uh, if they are civil, sometimes if it's not civil, they'll go and take the life of the other guy. <laughs> and yes, and there are rapes and uh, murders and uh, whole villages burnt because one uh, one person from this uh, 
Harijan village went there and uh, had a relationship uh, with an upper caste uh, uh, woman and now uh, as an outrage the whole village uh, there are stories of villages being burnt with people inside and women raped and uh, yeah you can <coughs> have yeah wasn't wasn't that interesting that untouchability wasn't important when it came to raping people yeah. That's right. Yes, yeah, part, part of the video there. You know what, you, someone drinks a cup of tea and you smash that because someone's untouchable, but raping's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, that is gender, gender, apart from caste, gender is a big issue for, I mean, if you think of India in the future, gender discrimination, how we look at uh, women. You've heard of missing women, uh, you know, the, uh, because in these days with technology, you know, it, you, you would think modernization actually will help uh, bring equality. But actually it has gone the other way. With technology, people now can do ultrasounds and then they can say, although it's officially banned since 1993, but they can do ultrasounds and then figure out whether it's a boy or a girl. And then if it's a, if it's a, f a female, then they abort the baby. And it's, uh, uh, now the ratio has actually gone down. For every thousand boys, there used to be 9852, I think is the ratio it should be. Uh, and, uh, or no, 952 for every thousand. And now in, in some states in India, for every thousand boys, there are like 830. Hmm. Um, because of, uh, of these um, ultrasound and it's gotten easier. Hmm. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to, I just want to stop just for a second because I'm looking at the, the clock. And sometimes I, I hesitate to do that. But while we have almost everybody here, I'd like to give Dr. Namal a round of applause here. Oh, thank you. And Dr. Namala understands that people have other jobs and they have to go to classes and things like that. But we have roughly 10 minutes and I really want to take advantage of it. I had about 20 more questions to ask Dr. Namala and I'm never going to get to those. So I'm not going to worry about that. I really like the conversation. But we probably have about seven or eight minutes of questions we can ask. So if you're thinking about it, and a lot of people do, they think about it and go out there, please. Just introduce yourself for, for the benefit. And the first one, the ABC one, basically, I guess, India's uh, mass population results, like all the cities are, that has slums and, uh, I guess, like, area for lack of uh, sewer systems and mm -hmm. much of the government and stuff. Uh, if uh, India intends to become the third largest uh, economy uh, within the next 10, 20 years, how does it intend uh, to do so with a uh, lack of infrastructure? And, um, that's why I think uh, all those projections, at least from my point of view, are overblown. Um, it has massive problems. Um, you know, okay, maybe GDP will will be from 1.3 trillion to uh, 5 trillion or. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't higher GDP does not necessarily mean that people's welfare has has uh, has improved. Uh, India already has their GDP has quadrupled since the last 20 years or so. But um, but still, there are 800 million people who earn less than uh, um, two dollars a day. So I, I, you know all those things about um, GDP. The well, you true. There are a lot of uh, you know technology exports, outsourcing, it's growing through that. But where is all that growth? It's all, all that growth is actually trickling up to just a few who have benefited a lot. And if, if India's uh, standard of living overall has to improve, then lots of challenges, you know, cultural challenges in some ways uh, with regard to gender and caste and corruption. Actually, there's a huge corruption scandal going on uh, uh, right now as we speak. There's one guy who's gone on a fast. Um, he just ended his fast of, uh, a week ago, I guess, and it, he has rallied all the youth now because there's massive corruption scandals in the Indian government. Um, and now they're, they've pledged that they will do something. We'll see. OK, good question. One of, please. Hello, my name is Jose. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, do you think since uh, India's population is growing so much and it's getting so big, do you think maybe they'll implement some kind of like law or something like they do in China where they limit the number of kids that you that they can have? Um, you know, they tried it once uh, under Indira Gandhi in the in the 70s. Um, uh, and it was very, there was a big backlash uh, against that. Um, so I think it's it's unlikely that that might happen. And you know, if that happens, there are actually lots of side effects, um, negative effects, uh, where then this will intensify. Then, if you're if you're making me choose only two bo two two children, then um, then I want to make sure that uh, I, that there are two boys and that not two girls. Or um, and you know, China's uh, China's uh, sex ratio is much worse than India, uh, and and some of that is caused by policies uh, like that. Um, so I think there are some negative effects of a policy like that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, please. Go How many problems, if any, would you say are directly related to the religious and cultural differences in India? And if any, how do you propose, like, what's the most effective and humane, like, method to overcome these problems? Um, you know, I, I'm speaking like an outsider because I'm a minority in India, 2%. Of, um, I would say caste is a big problem um, from my perspective. Um, um, and caste is what has uh, what has uh, shackled the people. I mean, like the untouchables, Dalits. There are like almost 200 million or 160 million uh, people. Um, and then there are, you know, even the lower caste. And unless um, somehow we we overcome caste, then all the other problems will still remain. Uh, that somehow that's in our mind system. Somehow that has to change <laughs> our mindset. Mm. Dr. Namala, hmm. do, do you see any fallout if you moved away from the caste system? I, mean, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have said that it's really shackled the economy of, of India, that we have to move away um, from the caste system. And I think that's the point that you're making now. What would be a, a negative aspect? What would be a flip side, do you think, after all these centuries of having a caste system, if that was abolished? I mean, yeah, in yeah. reality, not the, not the legislation, but people live that way. I mean, would there be a backlash? And well, you know, caste in some sense has given a sense of identity, you know, for people. To, uh, uh, even though I may, I may be a Brahmin, but I am poor. But, you know, psychologically I know I am, uh, I am poor, but I am pure. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it gives a sense of who you are in the world, in the, in the, in the universe. Um, so, when you remove that, well, that's a, that's a damaging thing sure, for, sure. for that person. You know, I have a, a wife and two daughters, and I'm a slave at home, but at least I know I'm a slave. That's, uh, you know, come home. <laughs> we have a caste system at my house, too. You know. All right, we've got a couple minutes. Let's, you're thinking of asking a question. Let's get out. Dr. Namala has just taken time. We've had a busy day, and we, we have a couple minutes left. Anybody wanted to, you're in front of a microphone. If you turn on the green light, come on. Um, Muhammad Abbas, uh, I believe before there was like tension, I mean, like, I mean, there's tension among the caste, I believe before there was tension among religions and stuff too. Does that still continue to be the case in India? Um, tension amongst religions, yes, yes, I think that there is a, um, you know, a subtext of, uh, of that always there. I mean, you see that um, uh, in the India-Pakistan uh, <laughs> World Cup final, and then, you know, there, there is this Indian nationalism, but uh, under the subtext is also this Hindu-Muslim um, thing, sure. Uh, um, they're there at one level, but on another level, uh, you know, growing up, uh, in some ways maybe it has gotten worse. I don't, 
I, but you know, on the other hand, we old people we like to <laughs> romanticize what it was like when when I was growing up. It was, didn't wasn't a problem. I mean, I had lots of Hindu friends and Muslim friends, and uh, and it's still true to this day too. But you know, sometimes uh, religion then becomes uh, uh, an issue. But for most more day to day, it's not uh, an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. One or two questions here? Anybody like to ask? If you guys don't ask a question, I have to dance, so go. I was just wondering to, like when Indian, when, when people leave the country from India, do they still follow the caste system and like the different uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but you know, when it comes to marriages, and the rituals, though I think they they still follow them. And you know, if I'm, if um, uh, if you come from a caste where you don't eat um, meat, you would follow that, and uh, you wouldn't eat meat. And uh, you know, even in India, it's just a taboo to eat um, eat beef mm, in general. And uh, and it and it's uh, even amongst uh, Christians, even though they are not Hindus, even Christian families, they like to set apart, uh, set themselves apart by saying, "Oh, we don't eat meat." And I have my cousins who would not eat meat; they will eat only lamb or goat meat. And <laughs> uh, so, yes, they follow those uh, here too. Hmm. Okay. I have one of my um students that I don't see here today that brings me vegetarian Indian dishes and we share some of the, the recipes down there and I think she's looking after my cholesterol so she wants me to have some of these vegetarian dishes so I think that's uh, you know been transplanted please can you um oh, can you just get close to my we can too, we can hear you but the people that are um, I don't have a question I just have a comment all the other questions or I guess it's kind of question how would you explain to an outsider that's like not in because I'm Indian not, how important the culture is to, for the basis of the caste system how how important can you like how, how important like religion and culture is for the basis of the caste system mm -hmm. <laughs> like how would you explain that to a you mean I, I you saying, got 30 seconds. can you have <laughs> Are you saying, can you have Hinduism without caste? Is that... Yeah, I guess, but like, since it's tradition and it's always like been preserved, like, how can you change that? It's like you, or how would you extrapolate approach? one from the other, is what you're saying? Yeah. I don't know, that's a hard question. Um, um, Let's go to commercial. I, I'm not a... <laughs> I, I, I'm not a scholar, and you know, nor am I a Hindu, so I think it's better if you ask somebody, if you're a Hindu yourself, then you can, you can help us. It's a tough question, yeah. <laughs> Of that, then they don't have any jobs. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, then yeah. they don't have any jobs, and like it's actually hurting them than helping them. So in some sense, in some yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. But it's still inhumane. Okay. I've got a. I, I don't mean no. <laughs> the only reason I got to step in is it says 3:30, and we're actually on TV around the world. Uh, this is even more popular than CNN. So, I, uh, <laughs> I again just want to thank everybody. There are a couple things really. If I get this in in 10 seconds, but Bernice Watson always in in the back doing all the technical work to make this happen, and the students. And I have never had this good of a showing giving Dr. Namal. I gave him two minutes warning. Would he come out there and do this for us? So I'm very appreciative of Dr. Namal all in 3C Media for doing this and all the students that come out there. I'm very appreciative. So thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. No, thank you. Real pleasure.